Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Wells. I'm the Marketing Director here at Envirosite. I want to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, An Introduction to Cooperative Purchasing. So today we'll be discussing how cooperative purchasing can help fast track municipal procurement and steps you can take to take advantage of these nationwide programs. Um, our format today has us engaging in a panel discussion for about 30 minutes and then fielding some of your questions. So if you have any questions arise during the presentation, be sure to type them into the questions panel on your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of these as we can at the end of the presentation. Uh, you'll also find a resource panel in GoToMeeting with a copy of our white paper, which is called Fast Tracking Municipal Procurement, uh, what you need to know about cooperative purchasing contracts. Um, you can download this at any time. And lastly, the full audio and video for this webinar will be available to you for download after we conclude. So with that out of the way, um, I would like to introduce um, our panelist, Steve Sebastian. He's the channel development manager with Envirosite. Um, he gets involved with a lot of transactions that happen using contract purchasing. And unfortunately, because of weather in Texas, uh, we are not joined today by Tanya Campbell, um, who's the Senior Communications Coordinator with HGAC. Um, so we wish her well in dealing with that situation. Um, and Steve and I will work to get through uh, the topic um, and impart everything Steve knows uh, to the lot of you um, so that you can have more comfort um, with cooperative purchasing and have some strategies for implementing it within your organization. So um, Steve, nice to have you with us today. Uh, the first question I want to throw your way um, is uh, just, can you explain the process municipalities have traditionally followed um, to procure capital equipment? How does it work? What are the drawbacks? Oh, thanks, Jake, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, sorry that Tanya couldn't make it. Um, well, typically in the past, um, municipalities um, were following a specification and bid process um, to procure equipment. Um, it was initially uh, put into place for several reasons. One, the specifications were so that they were assured that they get what they needed as opposed to a vague, um, you know, uh, just a referendum to ask for a piece of equipment. This way, they got very specific in what it is that they needed. Um, then those specifications would be published. Typically, it was a two-week process. They must be publicized for two weeks. Um, then subsequently, the bids would come in and um, they would be opened and the lowest responsible bidder would then and should be awarded um, the contract or um, that piece of equipment. Uh, this system still is in play today. Um, and the reasons that it was done as such, like I said, the specifications were put there so that they made sure that they didn't just say, ask for a dump truck and end up with a half ton that had a bed that lifted off of it when they really needed a two and a half ton dump truck. Um, so that was the reason for the specifications in the bid process. The thought there was um, that it makes it fair and not only for um, other manufacturers to capture their business, but also for the entity themselves to assure that if they wrote a specification around one in particular piece of equipment, that that manufacturer or the representative of it did not take advantage of them monetarily by knowing that his or her specifications were the only ones that were gonna be met 100%. Um, so those were the reasons of that kind of procurement. The downfall to that system and over the years, um, what ends up happening is um, you have a lot of infighting amongst representatives and manufacturers about specifications that are put out that it is leaning towards one piece of equipment. Um, Unfortunately, that opens the door for the entity or the end user to end up with something they didn't need by having to publish what we would call, uh, for a lack of better terms, a watered down specification, something very broad and open. Um, and, it, you know, it loses 
the whole idea of specify, be very specific. Um, so what ended up happening was somebody that may not even have been involved or presented or demonstrated a piece of equipment could end up with uh, being awarded uh, the contract or uh, you know the sale, and then the end user is left with whatever it is that they um, you know they accepted. Um, so it created a lot of infighting, um, made a lot of work for the end user because they would publish these specifications, they would put out this bid, feeling very comfortable in what they've done, and then the phone calls would begin and addendums would have to be put out. Addendums meaning somebody said, hey, I can't bid on that because this specification says this. Is there any chance I can ask you to either remove that or alter it so that it makes it more open? And then another um, legal document or publication would have to go out um, and the clock typically would start again um, after that addendum of it being out there two weeks so that this process um, could come to fruition. Um, and hence the need or um, the arise of these cooperative purchasing entities comes online where it fulfills everything that that process that I just spoke to does and does it legally. Um, it, it allows people to um, do exactly what it is that they would have done with a bid process with the specifications. I don't know if that right. answers what you ask. Yeah, it does. Um, could you describe what it what it looks like when somebody procures equipment using a cooperative purchasing contract? What are the steps and how do they help circumvent some of these drawbacks that you describe about the competitive bidding process? So it really, really simplifies the process. And um, so now, um, we've made a decision that we're going to move forward to make a purchase of equipment. Um, we begin the process of um, reaching out to those representatives of these pieces of equipment. Um, we then go through our, you know, as an end user, we go through whatever process we feel comfortable to make the decision on the piece of equipment that we want. Um, and then once that's done, it, it, then what we can do is we can talk to that representative. We question them uh, accordingly um, in the manner of, hey, are you on a cooperative purchasing contract? Um, typically, um, it's so well um, I, I guess the word I'm looking for is it's done so much now that most every sales representative and their manufacturer is on some form of cooperative purchasing contract. And then what typically happens is that sales representative will help direct that entity of the next step. If he's somewhat um, not versed in it, it's a pretty simple process. Um, you You're going to he, he directs you to that contract, who it is. And for example, HGAC, uh, you'll go to their website um, and they're pretty informative on how to become a member. Um, and again, understand that each one of these contracts have slightly different nuances, but from a 10,000 foot view, it's pretty simple. You go to their website, um, you register, um, you will be issued a member number, um, then you contact that sales representative. You say, hey, I'm now a member of that cooperative purchasing. Um, I need you to fill out a worksheet. Understand that the worksheet is filled out according to all of the contract's rules. So this is the part of a purchasing contract that fulfills the bid side. So now this, all this equipment has already been pre-bid by the purchasing by the cooperative purchasing so the bid process has already taken place and these are the numbers that were secured so no altering of those numbers can occur um, you can pick the piece of equipment and option it exactly as you need um, that's what will be all filled out on that worksheet um, then you'll take that worksheet and and you'll submit a purchase order in accompaniment with that worksheet to both the cooperative purchasing agency and your sales representative. Um, the cooperative uh, purchasing agency, once they receive the worksheet,
sheet and the purchase order, um, what they'll do is they'll take their contract that is with that manufacturer and make sure that everything is as it should be, um, meaning that the numbers all match accordingly. And then um, they will return that to both you and the sales representative. And upon um, the receipt of that, that is the trigger typically for the sales representative um, to then go ahead and place the order. And, um, and then the sales process usually follows suit as, as it normally would under a bid process of the order is now placed. Um, and then, you know, it'll be uh, delivery and all that stuff will be worked out between the sales representative and the end user. Excellent. So we typically see this in the context of procurement of sewer inspection equipment, but there's a whole basket of products that any contract purchasing cooperative will offer. Can you describe a bit the range of products that municipalities are procuring through these types of contracts? Oh, it, it, it ranges in um, from the smallest, meaning office supplies, uh, janitorial supplies, all the way up to what we're most familiar with, which is capital equipment. But there is usually a cooperative purchasing contract um, for, like I said, even the smallest of things. Um, and some, that's their genre. They will, um, th that's where they feel their sweet spot is and they stay in that genre and don't, they may not offer the capital equipment. And there's others that will not, um, will not take the time to put some of the smaller stuff on. So it really, it, it, what it takes is just talking to the representative um, of what it is that you're looking to purchase and they'll direct you to the contract. And I assure you that they're on one if they're speaking to you about a particular product. But it really, there is a contract from, um, you know, stem to stern on this stuff of what you can purchase off these contracts. Got it. And in the realm of municipal procurement, um, what are the most popular contract purchasing agencies that, that you encounter? Um, you know, HGAC is certainly one of them. Um, understand they are national. Um, there is some cooperative purchasing done in you know, that is um, governed sometime by the state or inside of um, counties, those kind of things. But nationally, NJPA, HGAC are two of the ones that I'm most familiar with that um, I see coast to coast and north to south being used the most. Great. And so a lot of municipalities are availing themselves of cooperative purchasing, uh, but some still use the competitive bidding process. Can you tell me a bit about what kind of customers you see using cooperative purchasing um, and why some still use competitive bidding? Uh, typically, um, what I'm seeing, I, I'm gonna defer to those that are still using the specification and bid process. Um, what I have found is most of them, um, one, um, for a lack of better terms, they this is just what we've always done and they don't want to be the one that upsets the apple cart. Um, unfortunately, when you have that mindset, um, if it's your first time using that process, you will find out the work that that is involved in putting all of that together only to have, like I said earlier in the beginning of this webinar, the infighting that goes on. Um, those that are using that process, again, I find mostly are not um, not familiar with the cooperative purchasing or a little um, fearful of what that might mean. They're afraid they may be breaking some statutes, um, some some of the purchasing laws. Um, really, for those that are still under that mindset, the best thing to do is contact these cooperative purchasing um, and, and see what it is and how it truly works. And then you can take that to your solicitor. Um, and I promise you, it will be a less expensive route in the it, just in all the publications and the things that you have to do and the hours spent 
to put bid and specifications out there. Um, but I would I would not be fearful if, even though this is the way we've always done it, it never hurts to look at a potential change. It will it will change your life really. Um, and and I've spoke to so many people that that's what they used to do is the specification and bid process. And once they moved over to cooperative purchasing, it's made their life easier. And they what's really come of it is they got the piece of equipment or whatever it is they were trying to purchase, they got exactly what they needed and they were extraordinarily comfortable in the fact that they know that um, they weren't pigeonholed to do any business with anybody because typically if one manufacturer that represents, say, for example, a street sweeper is on a cooperative purchasing contract, so is every one of their competitors. So it's not like, hey, if I want to go that route, I have to do business with that specific manufacturer. It's not the case. In most cases, every one of those manufacturers is on there, which makes it fair to every single one of them. Their pricing is there for everybody to see prior to purchase. And it just comes down to the is your solicitor, are they comfortable with the legality of it? It obviously would not exist if if there was any um, if there was if it was illegal in any way. Uh, they would cease to exist if they were out breaking these um, any kind of laws in any way. So it's just research a little bit, take the time. Um, I, I think anybody that is not using these kind of contracts would be quite pleased that they took the time. Yeah, essentially it's just a way to systemize the competitive bid process um, in a way that leverages bulk purchasing. So I think to kind of summarize the benefits that you're explaining for cooperative purchasing, um, obviously there's better pricing. Um, so these cooperative purchasing agencies charge fees, but that's offset by the ability of the agency to negotiate with the supplier um, to, to get better pricing and pass it along to cities that are procuring through them. They also hold very high standards for service. Um, they do a lot of research to understand uh, the quality of the product, um, the resources that the vendor puts in play to, to serve the customer um, throughout the life of the product. Um, so, so those things kind of cover bases that smaller cities may not have the, the wherewithal to, to do, right? Correct. Um, it's, it, it, it also, um, when you're, when you're using these, um, cooperative purchasing contracts, um, it, it, it just, people lose sight of the manufacturers and the representative of them. When they go to a specification and bid process, their hours to um, fill out bids and there's money involved in that. So the thought of that if I stick with a specification and bid process that I'm going to get the best price possible is actually an untrue um, because they have to account for the amount of time that they're going to spend to surf through the specifications, make sure every I is dotted and T is crossed. And so that it necessarily, you may not see it on the surface. So there's these fees with these cooperative purchasing um, contracts um, and it may look like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to pay more, but in the very end, that is not the case. Um, because of the simplicity of it, um, the manufacturers and the representatives of it offer these purchasing contracts a, a much better price than typically seen on the bid and spec process. Yeah, and I think we know with the competitive bid process, um, it can devolve into technical objections when a supplier loses the bid, and this also helps circumvent that drama, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and the one thing that I can say that I've seen my experience in um, being involved with these, um, it, what you just spoke to, if it was a spec and a bid process, it's not over <laughs> uh, when it seemingly is over. The bids are opened, an award is made, you would think it would be over. But again, there's a lot of back and forth um, that goes on. Whereas most of the representatives and the manufacturers, um, it, when a cooperative purchase is made, they feel like, okay, you know, we had our shot. We did what it is that we 
we did all we could do um, and we lost that one and it truly is over. Um, the, I don't see them making the phone calls back to the entities and, and, and you know, jumping up and down about that was unfair because it is across the board, uh, across the board fair. Um, everybody had their opportunity. Um, this is the one I selected and it, it usually ends right there and everybody goes about their business from there. Um, and the bid spec process, uh, I've, I've seen it go on for months, weeks after what you would think would be an end. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think to kind of summarize the, the benefits that we're talking about here, there's there's also the instant gratification. I mean, you've got less bureaucracy, less red tape, so you can have equipment immediately rather than the gestation period that's required for a competitive bid procurement, right? Absolutely. And, and in most uh, municipal um, applications, <laughs> most of the equipment they use is seasonal. So any delay to the purchase um, could hinder their efforts for putting this piece of equipment into use. So anytime we can cut through the red tape and get an order processed and the manufacturer can receive the order, the better chances of that equipment landing in a, in a time frame that it will allow it to be used when it was designed to be used. Um, and, and the cooperative purchasing contracts cut through all that, what we spoke of. So it tends to get the equipment in the hands of the end user a lot quicker. Yeah, and I think when we talk about procuring through competitive bid uh, and the, the the time and just internal costs of it, I I remember something that Tanya told us just during our review of this webinar that procuring a fire truck can can take up to six hundred hours just of internal time. Absolutely, and then add on any delays to that, and you can see how far out do I have to plan before I buy a fire truck. Um, so anytime you can circumvent any kind of delays in the process, um, it tends to uh, benefit mostly the end user. Yeah, so cooperative purchasing is, is new to many people. And as, as we've discussed, especially when it comes to process, um, it's more comfortable to stay with, with what we know. Um, and cooperative purchasing is, is something where you have to join an organization, complete some paperwork, and follow new processes. And that can sound intimidating to some people, but is it really? I have to, a resounding, no, it's not. Um, the work that, in, in my opinion, the work that you will um, encounter on the other end of a bid and specification far exceeds the um, the work or the change that you will feel going in a cooperative purchasing um, down in uh, that avenue. Um, it's much less, it's much less. Change scares some people, I fully understand, but um, once you step over, I, I believe you'll see that it is a very simple process um, and you'll, you'll thank yourself. And lastly, who, who can you rely on to be an advocate in the process? I mean, you're certainly not in it alone and many vendors put a lot of time and effort into getting listed with cooperative purchasing agencies. Um, so they, they have a vested interest in making sure that their customers take advantage of these procurement channels. Um, who should somebody reach out to when they need an inspection crawler? Uh, if on, on the inspection side or any of the equipment, um, the, your your local sales representative who uh, represents it will be your your first contact into um, not only the equipment, obviously, but the purchasing contract. Um, he's going to be um, well versed. If he's not, somebody inside of his organization will be well versed in how to direct you to the the appropriate um, cooperative purchasing contract um, and or they will direct you to a representative of that purchasing contract that will take you step by step through it. Understand these cooperative purchasing contracts have to make it extraordinarily easy for you so that um, they do remove the stigma of fear. Um, so I promise you that um, your representative will be able to direct you first. if. If you feel like 
um, he's not that well versed, reach out to that purchasing, that co cooperative purchasing via the internet. There will be phone numbers there. You can communicate um, through their website and they will take you step by step and make it um, extraordinarily easy because they understand that's what it needs to be if there's going to, if somebody is going to have the fear removed. And likewise, if you run into any internal resistance, uh, your purchasing manager doesn't know how cooperative purchasing procurement works, you can you can put them directly in touch. A absolutely. And and I you know I don't want to digress a little bit, but there's a um, I, I got to say some that are still using the spec and bid process may have this idea of what these purchasing contracts look like because. Even years ago, there was some state-run purchasing contracts, and the downfall to and 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 I can't speak as for individual states, but there is some state purchasing cooperative purchasing. Unfortunately, under those, you have to buy exactly what the state had bidded. For example, if if I wanted a, a snow removal piece of equipment, whatever that snow removal piece of equipment, however it was specified and bid by the state entity that is offering a cooperative, you have to get exactly what it was that they had, meaning the mirrors, the lights, the everything. And so some have looked into that and found, well, that's not really what I want. So therefore this whole cooperative thing doesn't, it, it just doesn't suit our needs. I can't use it. Um, I implore those to look into more of these national ones to where you can refine what it is, exactly what you need down to the reflector and so on and so forth. Um, please don't judge them all by a past experience. Great, so just to kind of recap what we've discussed here um, with cooperative purchasing, you get better pricing, you get better service, um, Oftentimes the cooperative purchasing agency will negotiate more favorable terms than you're able to by yourself. Um, you encounter less bureaucracy, there's less red tape, um, and you get to you get to procure what you want uh, and have it in hand um, in a very short amount of time compared to what it takes through the competitive bid process. Um, does that sound like a fair summary? I certainly couldn't add to that. I mean, I think that's that's a hundred percent accurate. Um, everything that you said is um, what is on the other side of using a cooperative purchasing contract. Great. Well, um, we're running into the uh, <laughs> the allotted time that we've been given for this, so I'm going to wrap it up here and say that that uh, concludes our panel discussion. We have a few minutes remaining for questions. I haven't seen too many come in, so um, hopefully I'll take that as a sign that we covered the topic pretty thoroughly. Um, we did get one um, asking if you could just recap um, how this satisfies the need, the legal need for fair competition. Well, it, 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 a quick overview, not to get into the weeds, um, this stuff has been bid by the cooperative purchasing contract. So, there's your there's the, the the bid process in itself as far as the specifications and everything um what what it, what typically happens is it is bid as let's say for example for a sewer camera everything that that manufacturer offers for that has been asked to a number be put to it so that suffices that bid um, and obviously if every option available has been accounted for that would um, suffice the specification side so now you're just going to build your own puzzle from the pieces that have already been bid okay great and we had one last question come in about fees uh, who pays the fees um, who absorbs the the cost of routing a purchase through a cooperative purchasing agency <laughs> It typically, they vary from contract to contract. Um, so I cannot, I cannot speak to say, okay, you won't incur any of that cost. The vendor's going to incur it. The manufacturer's going to incur it. Um, 
they differ from contract to contract. Um, some some require a membership by the end user. Obviously, that membership has to be paid by the end user. Some there is you know contract fees. Typically, um, that's absorbed by the manufacturer or the representative of it. They've accounted for that, um, and the end user doesn't incur any cost at all. Um, so they vary. Again, reach out to your representative. He can he can tell you of anything that may be your responsibility. Uh, for the most part, I see the end users almost being scot-free as far as um, any kind of fees, but there is some, uh, but it, it's, it's all specific to the cooperative purchasing contract. Great, well, I think that's about all the time we have. So uh, I wanna thank you, Steve, for joining us today. Um, again, Steve Sebastian is the channel development manager with Envirosight. Um, and you'll see his contact information up on the screen. Um, anyone who's joining us today, feel free to reach out to Steve directly with any questions you have. He'll be more than happy to answer. Um, and I also encourage you to download a copy of our free white paper, um, Fast Tracking Municipal Procurement, What You Need to Know About Cooperative Purchasing Contracts. You'll see a link in your GoToWebinar panel on the right. Uh, it covers today's topic in even greater detail and offers some specific pointers for getting cooperative purchasing up and running uh, with your purchasing department. So uh, lastly, keep an eye out for an email that is going to link to a recording of today's webinar. Um, it's yours to review whenever you need to. So uh, thank you again for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon at another webinar. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a great day.